When I first played Skyrim back in 2013 and was getting familiar with the magic systems, I couldn't put my finger on it at the time, but I knew something was wrong. I didn't understand what or why, but when I used the magic in that game and sent fire at a bandit in one direction and swung my magic sword at a mutated spider in the other, I never enjoyed it. I mean, don't get me wrong, I loved playing the game and I wouldn't have completed four whole playthroughs if I didn't adore it, but it was specifically the magic systems in that game that set me on edge. So much so that in all of my various playthroughs, I've gone out of my way to avoid using that magic as much as possible. And every time I've thought about it since, it's been aggravating in the most irritating way, like an itch under my skin that I don't have the ability to scratch because I've never never come close to understanding why Skyrim's magic just felt so boring to me. That was until I picked up Death Stranding, and Hideo Kojima helped me in finding the answer that I had long lost hope of ever knowing. Now, Death Stranding is a divisive game. It's a Marmite game. You either love it or you hate it because it's essentially the most comprehensively fleshed out fetch quest ever made. For people who don't mind fetch quests, it's a masterpiece. But for the people who do, it's, well, the opposite. Uh, but while I played Death Stranding, as I wrestled with the idea of if I even liked the gameplay or not, something else weighed on my mind. And right now, I simply have to give credit where it is due. Because the world building in Death Stranding, it's beautiful. It is some of the best world building I have ever seen. As I played, I completely bought this fictional post-apocalyptic America with gleeful immersion. But once I finished the game and I took a step back, I compared it to Skyrim. And I realised that for all of that game's exhaustive world building, Skyrim never once came close to immersing me in the same way that Death Stranding did. And that makes no sense, right? Because Skyrim has this exhaustive gallery of gods. The wiki website has over 65,000 articles, for Christ's sake. There are a million and one magic systems. Thousands of characters, dozens of secret organisations, so many different sapient species that make up the population, and a hundred different towns and villages. There is such an immense quantity of world building in the Elder Scrolls series, yet such a simple game like Death Stranding with a relatively simple world captured my imagination more than Skyrim's ever did. Now, I'm not saying that Death Stranding's world is somehow objectively better than Skyrim's. You just can't judge things like that in an objective way. But what I am saying is that the world of Death Stranding has a vital quality that Skyrim's lacks. So enough beating around the bush, that quality that Death Stranding has that Skyrim's doesn't is a feature that after a fair bit of research I haven't actually found any instance where a writer has ever coined a name for it, which kind of shocked me because you'd think it's one of those fundamental building blocks for world building, so for the sake of this video, just so we can name this thing and move on, we're going to call this idea internal realism. And what is internal realism? Well, I would say it's how real the world is, but there are plenty of fantasy worlds out there with crazy magic that have this strong realistic feel, so rather I would say it's exactly that. It's does the world feel real, despite the fact that it may be inherently unrealistic. Okay, so you know what a plot hole is, right? It's when the plot doesn't make sense because the logic doesn't add up. Well, when a creator fails to have internal realism, it's exactly like a plot hole, except it's not for the story, it's for the world that it inhabits. Okay, so as an example, in Skyrim, there's a quest in the city Morthal where you get on the wrong side of the law and get thrown into the local jail where the prisoners are forced to mine. And when the player gets thrown into this prison, they have everything taken off them. Every piece of armour and weaponry in their inventory is confiscated, and that makes sense right because it would be totally ridiculous for these guards to allow any prisoner to enter the jail with any weapon of any kind. However, I'm sure anyone who's played Skyrim before knows where I'm going with this, because the moment you get thrown into the prison with the other unarmed defenseless prisoners, you can do this.
Now, is it just me, or is there a subtle reason, just, just a tiny little nagging hole that doesn't make very much sense here? Uh, you can summon fire magic, or ice magic, or magic swords, or use the shout magic and massacre the prison population en masse the very moment you get put into this jail. There is nothing the guards do to cater for your magic abilities before they throw you in. The guards act as if the concept that a magic user might be in their prison is a total impossibility. And if magic in this world were an extremely rare thing, it would kind of make sense that they wouldn't think about magical security so much. But the problem with this is that magic in the world of Skyrim is far from a rare thing. A huge chunk of the population is well versed in using magic spells. I mean, as far as I can tell, every last man, woman and child has the ability to learn a spell that's capable of harming another person. So why in this prison do the guards do their duty? diligence of taking away the prisoners physical weapons but do nothing to cater for the large percentage of the population that can wave their hand and burn someone to death. The answer, the excuse for this feature in the world, it isn't just negligence from the guards perspective. There is no excuse, because if this world had even a shred of internal realism, the guards would do at least something to try and nullify your powers before they throw you in with the other prisoners. And the fact that they don't is immersion-shatteringly unbelievable. I mean, there are potions that already exist in the game that inhibit magical abilities when taken. Surely it would be standard practice for every prison in the world to force these anti-magic potions into the diet of all of their prisoners, otherwise it would be a security nightmare. Bethesda added their magic systems and totally failed to consider what the ramifications would be if said magic really existed. And as a result, the world is unimmersive, at least to me, because the world has a great gaping hole in it, and Skyrim has way, way more holes than just this one. This is just one example to prove my point, and we will explore or other errors in Skyrim's world building later. But before we do, let's compare that to Death Stranding. So in Death Stranding, there's this element called Timefall. Essentially, as a result of this paranormal apocalypse, rain causes extreme aging to everything it touches. When I first saw Timefall in Death Stranding, where it touched the protagonist's hair and it instantly turned grey, I, I thought it was pretty cool. It's a creative idea that we haven't really seen before, and I expected it to be a little more than a fun gimmick. But the thing is, it evolved to be so much more than that. Anything on the player's back rusts when it's raining, which degrades its condition and presents this whole issue the protagonist has to deal with in his daily life. Uh, if you leave anything out in the open, like a truck or a ladder, it will gradually rust and deteriorate because of that time fall. And all of this is cool. Uh, it makes the world feel more dynamic as we see the repercussions of this time fall's existence. But then we see a guy fall to the grisly fate of being trapped beneath a vehicle, exposed in the open, and then this rain hits his face and instantly ages him in this just beautifully horrifying cutscene. We see the awful human cost that happens when someone gets caught out in the rain, and this time fall is gradually transcending a mere gimmick. It's becoming a downright fascinating aspect of this world's lore, and the effect of this time fall, it reaches further than just the human cost. It affects the ecology as well. When I played and looked at the landscapes, I noticed that this world is almost entirely moss and grass, but why? Uh, I mean, sure, you come across the rare cops of trees here and there, but the vast majority of the landscape is this barren bog. But this is set in the United States, right? The US ecosystem doesn't look anything like this, so why does this world have such simple plant life? And then I realised, it's because of the time fall. The, uh, the reason why there are so few trees and bushes is because the time fall rapidly ages everything it touches. It essentially kills any living thing that's exposed to it. That means deer, that means squirrels and birds and bugs and trees. So that's why it's all moss and grass, because the rain has completely obliterated this world's ecosystem and makes it so only very short-lived plant life like moss and grass has the ability to grow anymore. And one thing 
thing that's just the cherry on top is there is no in-game journal or wiki article explaining why the ecosystem is so devastated or even stating that the ecosystem is devastated. It's just there in the game and Kojima passes the ultimate test of any world builder where he adds something really cool but has the discipline to not shove it into the player's face and leaves it in the background. As a result, most people probably won't even make the connection that this is why the landscape looks like this, but when they do, it just makes the world so much cooler. Now that effect on the ecosystem is a really interesting attention to detail, and it really does help to make the world feel more interesting, but I think the moment when I was playing Death Stranding, when it just sealed the deal, where I just surrendered myself to loving this world and knew I just had to make this video, is when I stumbled across a brewery, and this brewery just so happens to use Timefall. They take that extremely deadly rain that has ruined society, destroyed the ecosystem and caused countless deaths, apply some good old human ingenuity and they use it to decrease the amount of time it takes to brew beer and make the whole production process so much cheaper. So far we see Timefall take people's lives and ruin our day and generally be a total nuisance, but in this tiny corner of this world we see these people exploit this deadly paranormal element in a creative way where it's actually a benefit to society for a change. And that is just awesome. Uh, if Timefall were a thing in the real world, of course someone would have the bright idea of using it to decrease the time it takes to ferment alcohol. It makes the whole world of Death Stranding feel so realistic, so immersive, because not only are the ramifications of Timefall extremely well thought out where every effect it would have on a living world is considered, but the people in that world don't just act like Skyrim's NPCs. They act like human beings and do the very human thing of trying to find creative exploits for even the most dangerous aspects of their surroundings. Bethesda did the antithesis of what Kojima did. I, I, I may have miscounted, but Skyrim has 100 magic spells. 100! That is an insane quantity of magic. Most fantasy novels I read have like one or two magic systems, but like 100? Uh, don't get me wrong, they're fun to use, but it seems like Bethesda's whole approach to that game's world wasn't to make a world so carefully thought out that it gives player full license to immerse themselves, to feel the nip of the brisk air on their skin as they climb the mountains, or uh, smell the warm spices of the bustling marketplace under the midday sun. Bethesda's method was to add one cool feature, then move on and add another cool feature, then another, then repeat a few thousand times, filling the world with a huge quantity of world building, all the while neglecting the effects those things would have on an actually real world. As cliche as it sounds, with Skyrim, Bethesda made their world as wide as an ocean, but as deep as a puddle. And for those of you out there who are avid fantasy readers, I'm sure you've heard of the author Brandon Sanderson. He's incredibly prolific, writes some fantastic books, and really is the person to pay attention to if you want to learn how to world build, especially when you want to create a really interesting magic system. If you haven't watched Sanderson's creative writing lectures on YouTube and you have even like the faintest interest in writing, you are seriously missing out. Like, like for your own sake, go watch them like right after seeing this video. It's free on YouTube and I have learned so much from his lectures. But a while ago, Sanderson created three laws to consider when creating a magic system, and when it comes to his third law, I I found it quite interesting. Sanderson's third law. Go deeper into a magic instead of wider. This is the idea that a fewer number of things in a world building situation that are well explored will actually feel like a wider, cooler world than a large number of things explored very shallowly. Okay? It's the idea in Hollywood and in our own psychology that bigger is better. But bigger can have multiple different meanings. I find that a magic system that you have explored deeply in an interesting way is far superior to a large number of things. Can I make them opposed to each other? Can I make it so that they are tied to the economy to the religion. If I can tie these things all together to a couple of my magics, will I have a better experience for the reader? The answer is generally 
going to be yes. That's what's going to happen. Considering the ramifications of what you already have is worth doing instead of creating something new. And here's the thing. None of this is to say that you can't have a tremendously wide world and have that world be immersive. There are many writers like Tolkien or George R. R. Martin who have done exactly that, but what this is to say is as you increase the scope of your world, that exponentially increases the amount of work you have to do if you want to make every aspect of your world actually interesting and not feel like a Skyrim magic spell where it's just a surface level thing. Uh, but as you add more elements to your world, World, the, like the butterfly effect of ramifications those impacts have on the culture and economy and religion, it, it just starts to get very crazy very quickly. So that's just something worth considering when you're trying to create your own world. But as a general rule, it's better to go deeper than wider. And I, I, I know that one of you guys is going to timestamp this and say in the comments, that's the title of my sex tape. Don't do it. You're better than that. But as long as you think things through and kind of like simulate in your head what would happen if this new element were in introduced, as long as you do that, it will do wonders to make your world have a much stronger internal realism, and as a result, it will make it so much easier for your audience to fall in love with your world. And I mean, the last thing you should do, the absolute last thing you should ever do, is introduce a spell to your world called Transmute Ore. <laughs> Like, I have never in my life seen a more poorly executed magic system in like any fiction than the spell Transmute Ore in Skyrim. So for those of you unfamiliar with Skyrim, there's a spell called Transmute Ore. Using this, you can take a chunk of iron ore and turn it into an equal amount of gold ore with the low cost of a little bit of magicka. This spell has absolutely no lore around it. Like, I checked the wiki, I scoured the internet, like, out of the 820 in-world books in this game, none of them even, like, mention this magic system of turning iron into gold. Like, there are no lines of dialogue where, like, a wizard tells you the history and impact of this spell on the world. World. Truly, the creators didn't spend a single second trying to integrate this magic into this world. They added it for no other reason than because it's a cool gimmick. But here's the, the problem. Like, I... I <laughs> but the spell to create gold exists, and the world of Skyrim has a gold-based economy. <laughs> Can I remind you that the currency everyone uses in Skyrim are gold coins? That means that anyone who knows this spell can buy a ton of iron ore, turn it into a ton of gold ore, and all he then needs to do is create a like somewhat halfway decent mold, and now he has the ability to literally print money. Now, I won't flesh this point out, because Bethesda didn't flesh their world out, so why should I do that with this video? But if just one person in this world had the ability to wave gold into existence, the effect it would have on a gold-based economy would look something like this. And this is why Death Stranding's world ensnared me. I mean, I'll go on a limb and say this is my favourite fictional world I've ever seen depicted in a video game. Uh, don't get me wrong, The Witcher 3, God of War and Mass Effect, all of those have brilliant worlds, but what I love about Death Stranding is the impressive discipline Hideo Kojima had when designing this world. He didn't do what so many amateur world builders do and go crazy. He didn't say, okay, now we're adding a new religion, now we're adding a new species, now we're adding a new economy based on rare metal, now we're adding 10 new magic systems with people who can shoot fire from their hands and also ice as well because that's cool, and also let's throw in another religion, and also let's just throw in another magic system as well for good measure. He only adds one or two elements, then painstakingly considers the ramifications those things would have if that world were actually real. And as a result, it is a highly immersive world. You know, unless you consider all that out of nowhere monster energy drink advertisement, uh, but people give Kojima a bad rap for shilling out to advertisers. At the end of the day, I sympathise with him, because he's just an influencer selling out his dignity to try and pay his bills. Speaking of which, Raid Shadow Legends is a shit game and you shouldn't play it. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I, they, they haven't sponsored this. Uh, a man's got to have some standards. Uh, but this video isn't sponsored by Raid, but it is sponsored by me? 
That, okay, that's, that was so cringe. Uh, basically, I just want to mention that if you guys are longtime fans of this channel and you want to see me make more of these kind of videos, it really would mean the world to me if you could support me on Patreon. Like, when I go out of my comfort zone and make, like, experimental videos like this, that's only possible because of you guys out there who are already supporting me on Patreon as you give me so much more stability with my channel and it allows me to have that creative freedom. And it, it, it just, it's... To those people who are already supporting me, thank you so much. I, I bloody love you guys because you are helping me live my dream and, and, and helping me just have fun with this channel because I can take experiments like this and see what happens. If you click that link in the description and support me, you will find a ton of cool rewards. You get access to my Patreon exclusive Discord server and we've got our own exclusive little community going on. Uh, you can watch all of my videos five days early. You can get your name credited in the description. And at the highest tier, I have a little consultation session where I'll take a look at your YouTube channel or read a little bit of your novel or anything in between and tell you what I think you can do to improve your craft. But by far the most important reason why you should support me on Patreon is because I have to worry less about shilling out to Raid Shadow Legends. Uh, th guys, this is blackmail. This is a stick-up. You don't support me on Patreon, and I'm going to do a Raid Shadow Legends brand deal. I I'm warning you, none of us want to see it. I don't want to see it, but I'll do it if, if you don't pledge. Unless you click that link right now and support me, I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> I promise as long as you guys support me on Patreon, I will never shill out to Raid Shadow Legends. I think if I was only supported by one person who gave, like, one dollar, I probably still wouldn't shill out to them. I mean, I, th I think if I was, like, starving on the street, homeless, I'd still probably wouldn't shill out to them. But anyway, back to it. Just because you're adding in fantastical elements like magic systems or rain that speeds up time, that is no excuse for being lazy. Uh, the reason why I say that is because I very much imagine there are people in the comments who are making the argument, but it's a fantasy. It's not supposed to be realistic. You're fine with having people shoot fire from their hands and rain that speeds up time, but you're not fine with a little oversight in the security of a prison? Yes, I'm not fine with it, and neither should you be. The argument that it's okay for your world to not make logical sense because it's a fantasy is flagrantly flawed. In a certain way, fantasy is identical to science fiction, in that the world establishes rules to which it adheres to, and when a writer explores his world, he must stick to those rules. If you're writing a hard science fiction, the rules of your world will be identical to our own, and if you don't stick to them, it will obliterate the believability of your world. If you're writing a fantasy where magic is a common thing, and you fail to consider something as simple as what magical security will look like in a world filled with magic, it will shatter audience immersion because it makes no sense. Skimp out on internal realism and your audience will see how that guy in the back of the shot is actually a cardboard cutout because it just fell down. And They will see how that gun the guy is holding is actually a prop. They'll notice how that maiden behind the bar isn't an interesting living person, they're just a character. Break the rules of your world and they will receive a stark reminder that your fictional world is nothing more than a construct, and a poorly constructed one at that. But right now, I think what would be really cool is if I stop talking about the theory and give you an example of what it looks like when you put this into action. Uh, it's time to do Bethesda's job for them. They've added so many magic systems to this game, and each is as poorly fleshed out as the last. But today we're going to be very nice, and we'll pick just one of Skyrim's magic spells. Like, just one. And we'll ask, how would it affect Skyrim if that world truly were a real place? So in Skyrim, there's a spell the player can learn called Bound Sword. Essentially, once you learn the spell, you can, with an extremely low magicka cost, summon a blade that in the game is as effective as a real sword. Its stats are pretty strong, and while there are clearly more effective weapons in this world, it's certainly a lot more effective than the standard steel sword. So how does this affect the world in the game as it stands? Well, of course, we already know the answer to that. It doesn't. Just like Transmute, all the magic was added because it's a fun gimmick, and its impact on the world was completely neglected by the developers. In the game Skyrim, the only instance I've seen where this spell was even like slightly fleshed out is the fact that some Thalmor soldiers you come across use it, and that's it. 
Uh, you, you come across the very rare person in this world who uses this spell. Now, I imagine a few of you are thinking, so what? A magic sword that people can summon, that's going to have almost zero impact on this world, if any. I mean, steel swords still work, right? They still function and cut things, so people will keep using them. The only ramifications this would have in a realistic Skyrim is a couple bandits and wizards use the spell in combat. That's it, right? Wrong. Like, like, Christ, that's so wrong. Uh, it, in Skyrim, it's labelled a novice level spell, which is the lowest tier of spell that exists. Now, I'm sure there's some extremely obscure book you can read in one of the earlier Elder Scrolls games from 2002, saying that lore-wise this is a very difficult spell to cast. But this game has the Bound Sword spell labelled as novice, and by this game's own logic, because it's the lowest difficulty spell, and it seems that every humanoid in this world can learn magic that logically means that anyone in this world with a little determination can learn how to use this spell. If you took Skyrim as it is in the game and ran it like a simulation with a working economy and society, the effect the bound blade would have on the economy would be colossal. The first effect we would see, the blacksmiths would go out of business because of course they would. It would be inevitable that the existence of these swords would cause a dramatic decrease in income for blacksmiths everywhere, because now almost every soldier, almost every last person who would ever have need of a sword in their life would ditch the steel and pick up the magic one, because it's a total upgrade in almost every way. With the one exception of the fact that it's a bit of a time investment to learn how to use it. Now, I'm no Shadowversity. I, I know bugger all about how swords act actually work, but I can guess that in medieval times they were bloody expensive. To get a blacksmith to make a sword for you must take a great deal of time from their part. It would cost you a fair pocket full of money, and once you have it you have to spend more time and money maintaining it. You have to sharpen it and clean it and make sure it doesn't rust. You need to worry about losing it because it's an expensive piece of kit. You have to worry about it being stolen. But now? Who in the world would want to use a steel sword when this far cooler magic one is not only free, but it's also in incredibly lightweight and only exists when you want it to, as you can summon it on a whim. Now as a soldier, you don't need to worry about lugging this cumbersome sword on your belt at all times, you can just twiddle your fingers and summon this blade on command. If Skyrim were a real world, all of the Jarls and Generals would want to save money anywhere they can, because of course they would. Any king or government only has a finite amount of resources, and by teaching every last soldier in the army, or every last guard in their town, to use the Bound Sword spell, it would save them an absolute fortune in equipment costs, as they would never have to buy their soldiers a weapon ever again. Also as a result of this bound sword existing, we would see an impact on more than the economy, it would impact culture as well. We would see weapon purists. In Whiterun there's a renowned club of warriors called the Companions, which is where the best fighters go to seek glory. It would make total sense if these hardcore warriors have a strict no bound weapons policy, but like when you speak to their leader, he says a real warrior uses real steel, and they refuse to let you in, so you throw away all that magic crap and buy a real sword. And these companions would be proud about the fact that they use real steel while no one else does. They'll boast about it and cry it out when in combat about how they've done what nobody else does anymore and they use actual metal weapons because they're just that hardcore. And don't get me started on how the spell Bound Bow also exists in this game, so everything I said that applies to blacksmiths, that also applies to bowyers and fletchers too, because who wants to pay money for arrows when you can have an infinite supply of free ones just by waving your hand. Now poor old Elendry, who owns the Drunken Huntsman, is joining the blacksmith in the bar, trying to drink away the pain because no one's buying his bows and arrows anymore, and he's on the brink of going out of business. And I appreciate that some details are too small to fully flesh out. World Builder's disease does exist, and it's totally possible to spend too much time fleshing out your world. I appreciate that world building for a massive world like Skyrim's is a demanding task, and maybe that excuses forgetting about one or two knock-on effects if these elements were real. But seriously, all of them? Every single logical ramification that would occur if the Bound Sword were a real spell. You forgot about every last one? Like, you couldn't even have a single line of dialogue where a blacksmith grumbles about all those magic swords out there and how they're inferior to real steel. How 
how hard would it have been to add like an NPC in the bar who was a former blacksmith and like you talk to him and he goes in this diatribe on how he's lost his whole income because of those damned inferior magic swords. How hard would it have been for the developers to program it so a good chunk of the people you fight against use these bound swords instead of steel ones? Like in the game you come across like the rare Thalmor patrol who uses them but it would be logical to have a way larger chunk of the population use these fantastic weapons because they're free, look badass and do more damage than a common steel sword. How about whenever you walk into a blacksmith shop instead of saying We've got small weapons as well as big. Maces, daggers, that sort of thing. He instead tries really, really hard to sell you on the idea that real steel weapons are superior to all of that magic crap in an attempt to sell you a sword, because of course he would if this world were real. He's desperate to sell as much merchandise as he can because he's been selling so little of it as of late and he wants to feed his family. How hard would it have been to add like a quest where there are two rival blacksmiths in one town and the town isn't big enough for the two of them? The state of the economy means that the demand for their work is too low to sustain both rival blacksmiths. So then the player has to decide in the quest which of the blacksmiths they want to sabotage by framing them for a crime and which one they want to help. Or the player can do nothing and leave them to slowly bleed to death financially. How hard would it have been to add these things? The answer is of course, not at all. Adding any of these things would have been no harder than adding any other line of dialogue or any other quest, yet it would have done wonders to make the world feel way more dynamic, as the player would have this strong sense that the world is real, because it's so carefully considered, and because it's finally got an economy that actually works. If only they had five spells instead of a hundred, but they fleshed those five spells out so thoroughly, so wonderfully, as we see the vast sweeping changes this magic would have on the world. I mean, sure, we'd have to give up the ability to shoot ice from our fingers, but it would have achieved the fundamental thing that great world building is all about. It would have made the world so much more interesting, so much cooler and immersive and awe-inspiring all in one go. Uh, but do let me know what you think. Do you think that I'm right? or seemingly, as per always, do you think I'm wrong? Uh, I'd love to know what you think in the comments down below. Anyway, thanks for watching. Don't forget to click that link in the description to support me on Patreon, and I'll see you guys next time on The Closer Look.